So this is my last day in Australia. <laughs> this evening I fly to uh, Singapore. So just express my appreciation, the hospitality Venerable Damasia has offered, and uh, the lay community here in Brisbane. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So this is a questions and answer period. So I shall try to answer any questions you might have. You know, so you can see they're they're changing. Sound of silence has a is it like a continuum? It doesn't have a beginning or end, and so it can be regarded as uh, the unconditioned because it, if you you know if you use it if you detect it then then. It, and have the attitude of kind of, it's not something you can grasp, but something you can refer to. It puts you always into the present moment. And it doesn't, like unlike the breath, which is <clears throat> arising and ceasing, inhaling, exhaling, uh, the sound of silence doesn't have any quality other than a, a kind of vibration continuous vibration. And I found that <clears throat> then the thinking mind stops. And and uh, then you you notice the the absence of thought. You know, so you you're kind of informing yourself with wisdom that there's the, the condition phenomenon which arises and ceases, then, then, there, then this must be the unconditioned, you know. This, is, this has no beginning or ending, but it's, it's, you're fully conscious. It's consciousness, of sound of silence, whatever that is, and, and awareness with wisdom, then you're, you're actually... Uh, educating yourself to to notice what is is uh, present, and and not just be aware of some condition that how you're feeling or your your state of mind or the breath, but actually the wh where these conditions arise and cease, and so it's like. Uh, it's like uh, I, I see consciousness as as pure and, and universal, unconditioned. Then we experience consciousness through senses, through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind, and we we experience the impermanence of sense consciousness, but. But when when the senses aren't engaged, when we're not engaged with with seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, there's still consciousness. 
And that's referred to as the unmanifest consciousness, because it, it doesn't manifest through sensory with experience, which is impermanent. And then the Udana, the Nibbana Sutta, there's the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And that sound of silence fulfills that. Because you can't imagine, you try to imagine, unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And I mean, all you can do is negate the born, the created, the form, the condition, so it's unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. But you can know, there's a knowing of unconditioned reality. You know, knowing of Dhamma. Dhamma is unconditioned. It's not, it's not dependent on other conditions. It's where other conditions come and go and change. But it's it's where, like like uh, in intuitive awareness or mindfulness, sati sampachanya, panya. The, these terms convey this kind of this this intelligence behind the the thinking mind, behind the emotional uh, habits you have. There's a knowing and consciousness. Then is is knowing it's 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 not it's not <clears throat> doesn't have any quality such as red or blue or good or bad, but it's 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 knowing its its function is knowing and it's it's discerning knowing it's not knowing about like your intellectual knowing is knowledge you've acquired through education, through life's experience, you know, through conditioning. But when when the Buddha points to direct knowing, sati sampachanya, mindfulness, intuitive awareness, uh, this kind of knowing is 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 what I what is generally referred to as direct knowing. It's it's not knowing about, it's knowing reality here and now. And the third noble truth, the Naroda Satcha, is, is where the, the, the consciousness recognizes itself. Now try to figure that one out. You know, but it, <laughs> but it, it like, like the second noble truth dealing with, with desire, Manifesting desire, three kinds of ignorance, desire, and, and attachment is the cause of suffering. And then the, the insight is to let go of the cause, let go of desire. And then when you let go of something, it doesn't mean, you know, you're not, you, you don't die, you don't faint. You're fully aware, and that's the niroda. It's it's knowing niroda, knowing uh, pure consciousness, and knows itself rather than knowing about itself. Where your thinking mind will have definitions, consciousness is like this, or you know you have various you know ideas about what. Freud or some scientist, psychologist said about consciousness. That's acquired knowledge. That's not direct. I have this story where I, I, wanted, I decided, you know, I was exploring consciousness this was years ago and in myself and then I I have to go and get the Pali dictionary to see how they define consciousness. I was on my way to the library and suddenly it dawned on me, I don't need to go to a dictionary to tell me what consciousness is. I'm conscious. <laughs> this is consciousness here and now. It's not, you know, 
how do you define it, you know, and what the Pali Dictionary says, or Freud, or Jung, or uh, Einstein, or whatever, you know, this is, this is, even what they say might be very good, but it's acquired knowledge, and suddenly it's like you wake up to the reality of being conscious, without it being conscious through the senses. And, and this is what this is this is so clearly formulated in the Buddha's teaching and Four Noble Truths and but that's why it's hard to understand from the intellectual level because intellectual knowledge is acquired knowledge and and insight knowledge is direct knowing. Well, we're, you know, we're from cultural backgrounds that where modern education, uh, you know, your education is, is rated very highly in any country in the world, and, and it's acquired knowledge. But where, where do they ever teach direct knowledge? You know, where do they ever point to that? And that's, hear it, let me hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and so it's but try to figure it out you can't you know it's 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 learning to trust to to recognize the the pure state of knowing it knows itself but it's not personal anymore it's not like the the ego and the personality are conditioned. They're they're acquired after you're born. You're not born with a personality or an ego. This is the interest of my life. <laughs> Doctor said it's tinnitus, and just forget about it. But then, about two years back, I think, when my mind started calming down, this was lasting. Right. I asked Ajahn Dhamma, he gave me your book, and that day I'm going to pick it up. So, Dhamma gave me the picture. Well, you know, like, you, you, like, thinking excites the mind. You know, you get excited, you get inspired, you, you get depressed, you, you think about the, what's wrong with the world, and then you, you feel depressed or disappointed, and then you, you can excite the mind. I mean, why do, why do people go to horror movies? <laughs> you know, why, why do they want to be scared out of their wits? <laughs> It's exciting, you know, and and people pay money to go and be frightened, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's entertainment or sex and violence. This is what movies are about, you know, uh, blockbuster films and all the explosions and bombs and war. War is exciting. Peace is boring. Peace is, is, is not very exciting, <laughs> where, where war is, and what is news but about murder and violence and scandal, not about peaceful, not about peace. <clears throat> and so, the, the conditioned realm is a realm of, of stirring, of irritation, of, of contact, you know, because you your, your human body and what you see, hear, smell, taste, such thing, irritates or excites or has an effect on, on consciousness. You know, so, we, 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 modern humans really like visual signs. Watching the television, watching the cinema, or doing things that are like sports or 
or, or life-threatening situation. Why do people climb rock cliffs? You know, when we were in Rio de Janeiro, there's somebody climbing the Sugarloaf Mountain. You could watch them, this little figure, <laughs> <laughs> climbing up this, this landmark Sugarloaf Mountain in, in the Rio Bay. And um, why does he want to do that? You can take a cable car to the top, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> but it's uh, it's uh, because it, it it's exciting doing exciting things in driving over the speed limit or whatever. This is this is exciting and. And so much of and so much of life is depressing because we think of you know just the boringness of everyday life of getting up and cooking a meal and going to work and waiting for the bus. So much of life is like that, and and uh, so, but like with mindfulness, the the like on a meditation retreat. You know, you you make it as boring as possible for everybody, <laughs> and so they can't. You know, put them on noble silence the first night, so they can't chat with each other and take away their cell phones, and uh, and then they then the routine. You know, everything's ordered. You tell them when when to get up in the morning and when to sit still, when to walk, and when to eat, <laughs> and yet uh, it's always amazed me how many people like meditation retreats, because it's it's uh, you know it's an opportunity to to find stillness in a society that that seeks distraction and excitement all the time, because too much excitement is it gets boring you know it, life doesn't have much meaning if you're just constantly distracting yourself and and uh, you know seeking the, the next distraction that uh, one right after another where in meditation retreats you you have to sit for 45 minutes to an hour still and just and and in that in doing that, people began to calm down. As you just taking anapanasati, watching the breath. If you concentrate on your own breathing, you you know you it'll get more refined and and disappear. It seems like you're not breathing anymore. Then people get upset because they think they're going to die because they're not breathing. <laughs> But it, it's like calming, moving towards calm. And that's the nature of consciousness. It's peaceful and discerning. It's not, it's not exciting though. Yes? Buddhism talks a lot about wisdom. So what wisdom should we be learning about or getting and how do we go about getting that wisdom? You mean like meditation or? Well, wisdom. Wisdom? Well, that's where, like investigating the Four Noble Truths is actually using wisdom. I mean the it's like Bhati Bhatta or Bhavana meditation is actually, I mean the, the Buddha, like Four Noble Truths are more like directional signs. Because wisdom is you, actually. <laughs> but, uh, but you're, you know, so it's not something you lack, but something that, that you, because you're, you're programmed to think and see yourself always in terms of a physical body or, or your emotions. So it's learning to let go of conditions 
to to allow wisdom to to operate through consciousness because wisdom panya wisdom and consciousness they're together so it's like the for, like in england for example the buddhist society in london was uh, one of the oldest european buddhist societies i think established in the 1920s and uh, they represent all forms of buddhism tibetan zen theravada <clears throat> and uh, they have classes, and then there's Mahayana and Vajrayana, and Theravada tends to be almost considered basic Buddhism, like primary school or kindergarten. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and so they all agree about the Four Noble Truths, but it's like when they wanted to teach basic Buddhism, they'd call on me. They teach the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> Where, you know, they call on somebody else to teach higher vehicle or Vajra, you know, Vajrayana, Tibetan, and that's even higher than Mahayana. And so, you know, this is how the mind thinks, you know, in terms of this is the, like, primary school, this is high school, this is university. And, uh, and so I, I was thinking, you know, like basic Buddhism, Theravada, uh, Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths are, oftentimes are not really investigated in, in, in Buddhist societies. The, I mean, it doesn't take much to memorize the Four Noble Truths. I mean, there's not, you know, it's not like... Uh, Abhidhamma, you try to, you know, memorize the uh, 52 Jada Seekers and so <laughs> you're really in for a lot of hard work. But four, you know, is a pretty easy number to, to cope with. But, and it sounds simple, you know, it's got, uh, and basic. But because this was the first sermon of the Buddha after his enlightenment, <clears throat> But I've spent 50 years investigating these Four Noble Truths. <laughs> and, you know, it isn't like, I mean, I had insight right off, you know, but, but also as you, as you live your life, as you, you know, you have to live your life with your family, in the society you're living in, in your profession, or workplace, and, and these Four Noble Truths are very, they, they help you to integrate this awareness and wisdom into um, daily life situation, and the ordinariness of your life. Where, you know, in, when, when you get into higher and better, then that, that's still conditioned phenomena where the you know, this is what conditioned phenomena is about. This is the best. This is like heaven is the best. And then the Buddhists say, well, nirvana is higher than heaven. <laughs> but that isn't what nirvana is. It's not about being higher than heaven. <laughs> and, and then uh, hell is, a Vichy hell is unmitigated suffering for eternity. I mean, you can't imagine anything worse than that unmitigated misery for eternity. I mean, there's no relief. <laughs> and so that is, that's taking, you know, the worst possibilities in terms of your thinking mind. And, and that's hell. And the best that you can think, the best, the superlatives is heaven. Heaven and hell are like, but Nibbana isn't about the best or the worst. The best and the worst arise and cease in consciousness. <clears throat> and so like a Vichy hell, unmitigated, <clears throat> absolute misery for eternity <clears throat> is impermanent. <laughs> I mean, this is wisdom. This is a certain... <laughs> 
no matter what what the the statement is, you know, un, unmitigated misery forever <clears throat> is 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 thought is thinking. <clears throat> it's not based on reality, except <clears throat> when you are miserable. It seems like an eternity. <laughs> Misery is, is is eternal hell, because it seems like it's never you know you can't imagine ever being happy again. <clears throat> but it is impermanent, and so this this learning to trust your awareness is uh, it, it's important to 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 this is something that when you start thinking about whether you're aware or wise, then you'll start doubting. It's a, it, the thinking, when you think about yourself, you'll never be quite sure where you're at. <clears throat> so that's why being awake and aware, it's like this. And, the, and then we're talking about sound of silence and unconditioned. It's, it's suddenly you're... You're holding holding attention to the present moment. You're not looking for for an object or for some exciting distraction or something to think. But it's like this: is suddenly recognizing awakened consciousness. It's just this simple. And and you and to trust it more. To to we have words like refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha and things like this that that remind us because we do we you know we're living in um, sankara forms and changing conditions and so you're constantly being irritated by sensory impingement <laughs> ever from the time you were born to the time you die this is what. Uh, life in a in a sensitive form is about, but knowing this is is awakened consciousness, and this is that this is your this is what we mean by Bhutang Zarnangachami, refuge in Buddha in awareness. Because suddenly you recognize this reality, you know this reality, and trust it. Because when you start thinking about it, you'll start doubting it again. Is this ultimate reality or not? <laughs> and that's where, like, uh, the sound of silence or this this uh, awareness opens up. And it's not, it, you're not playing games with your mind anymore. It's, it's natural, it's natural, it's reality. Well, awareness is just, uh, uh, you know, it's it's consciousness. Well, consciousness is a term more like to like a noun, and then awareness is more like when you realize consciousness. It's like this, and uh, so they. It's just a, a way of talking. And then discerning where, say, your thinking mind is is uh, discriminating. So when you think then this is, heaven is, is better than hell, and things like that. And, uh, and we, we, and it's, uh, dualistic. So you, if you've got good, you have to have bad. If you've got heaven, you've got to have hell. True and false, right and wrong, and and everything's divided into. If you have one, you have the other along with it. And and then the Buddha used terms like nibbana, which doesn't have any opposites, because it 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 isn't. It isn't a, the best, or it isn't a condition, and it can be r realized, but it can't be defined. 
and that r reality is is recognized through awareness and consciousness what can we do or how can we uh, help ourselves to let go of our egos just, uh, well, look at your ego. Listen to it. So I, I used to, I mean, because on one level, when I first started, I was trying to get rid of my, I thought having an ego is, you know, I, had a, I see it as kind of like a, something not so good. To say someone is egotistical isn't exactly complimenting them. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the sense of, uh, I don't want to be egotistical or proud, and, and, and then um, the idea of being humble. And, you know, in, in David Copperfield, Uriah Heep is this, is this <laughs> smarmy kind of, I'm the most humble of all, <laughs> which is ego. And, and so even trying to be the most humble can be egotistical. Or, you know, in America, I used to give retreats in California, and, they, and there was one man that used to go on the retreats, and he'd always say, you know, I'm an alcoholic. And he, but I haven't had a drink for ten years, and and I, every time I'd meet him, he'd say he'd announce that he's an alcoholic, <laughs> and I hadn't had a drink for ten years. <laughs> he's like this, and that's ego. I mean, the sense of a self, as being, where you define yourself as as good or bad, or ordinary, or humble, or proud, or the best or the worst. Uh, I mean. It, it, the ego is a created um, condition. So in in uh, Pali, Sakyaditi, in the the first fetter, the first Sanyojana, is uh, translated as ego. But <clears throat> I would deliberately listen to my ego. Or even have fun with it, like I'm the, absolutely the, the worst monk in the whole Sangha, is one, uh, you know, I deliberately think in extremities, uh, or I'm the best, I'm the best monk in the, in the whole Sangha. <laughs> or I'm just an ordinary monk, I'm not the best or the worst, I'm humble, I'm not going to, <laughs> and that's, uh, but I, I deliberately think uh, in terms of I am and me and mine, and listen to it. Listen to it, you know, and then you can play around with it, take it to absurdity, uh, to to incredible megalomania or or brutal hum, uh, humility or whatever. <laughs> and uh, uh, but you're listening to yourself, thinking I am good, bad right or wrong or just ordinary and humble and I'm nobody or I'm somebody or whatever whatever terminologies you use you're that which is aware you begin to see that that which is aware of thinking isn't thinking is it's not an ego like consciousness isn't an ego it, it, to to isn't sakya ditti to to become an ego, you have to think I am the best or the worst or just ordinary, and it's 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 your ego. The psychic depends on your thinking habit process, identity with your body. That I'm I'm eighty one years old is is uh, identity with the body and and if the e you know if I'm coming from the ego attachment to ego then when before you're 80 you you don't want to admit you're that old but this is from my experience after you're 80 you tell everyone <laughs> You 
because you're proud to survive. <laughs> <laughs> you're identified with an old body. <laughs> and, uh, this is, you know, the, when you're young, you know, you, I remember when I was a child, my sister was two years older than I was, and so she reached the age of ten, and she had a two-digit age. <laughs> And I could hardly wait to be 10 years old. <laughs> so I'd have two digits. I mean, this is ego forming, you know. Being 10 years old seemed old at that, and when you're eight. <laughs> and you're an older sister, you know, she's, she's, she's a kind of role model in your life because she's had more, she's had two years more experience than you. <laughs> but it's all relative, and then, and then being male or female, or being uh, black or white, or being, you know, whatever we identify with it, we cling to these identities, <clears throat> and and then we we have, you know, then we form all kinds of other views about what beauty and attractiveness or ugliness or whatever. We form a sense of our self-worth through what we look like, what others say about us. Um, and then the critical mind, you know, you start seeing things like uh, having thoughts that you feel are bad or you shouldn't think or uh, things change in your life as you as you lose your innocence then you then you're more exposed to 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 other conditions that affect consciousness and you form a, a sense of your self worth <clears throat> oftentimes very uh like in many cases very self critical other people are are, never criticize themselves. They always see themselves as better than somebody else. But that's not my experience. <laughs> so the, this, uh, just, but listening to this, to the ego, and you're you're no longer believing in the in the terminology, you know, in what it's saying. You're no longer thinking about it. You're just listening to. To I am good, I am bad, and a thing, and then after a while, you're this listening, you're this puto listening to this, these sentences of I am uh, this body, I am Ajahn Sumedho, and so forth, and then you you become you become aware of it as Sakya Ditti if you t attach to it. Nungpo Cha would always emphasize. In, in Thai terms, like samut sacha, baramata sacha, samut sacha is the is the uh, like conventional reality. <clears throat> so on a conventional level, I am Ajahn Sumedho is isn't ego. It's just samut sacha. It's just a convention that we use for communication, for discrimination in situations such as this. But it becomes an ego when I I am Ajahn Sumedho, and then I then the, then the and I don't have that perspective on Samut such a, on conventional reality. I always actually believe I am an Ajahn. I am a senior monk. I am somebody important or whatever. Or I'm not. You know, I'm not really that important. Then that becomes Sakyaditi. And Bharamata Satcha is ultimate reality, Bharamata. If it's Bharamata, then it's ultimate reality, it's Dhamma. <clears throat> so, and, and the, the wisdom faculty is discerning, knowing the convention reality is like this, and Bharamata Satcha is this. So it's discerning, it's not, it's not about Bharamata Satcha is better than Samut Satcha, or ultimate reality is better, then we're starting to think in terms of values. It's just discerning but what Bharamata Satcha, ultimate reality is this. And then 
samut sacha. Then we can use the conventions like the, we use the vinaya. That's samut sacha. That's uh, and conventional forms, uh, Theravada monastic tradition. That's samut sacha or the Australian government and so forth. I mean, we can still obey the laws of the land and perform our duties as citizens, uh, you know, and so they, uh, with with discernment, not with ego. And, uh, and where to to know the ego is to not not to have any, but to to discern the ego isn't that you get rid of it, but you you no longer grasp it. So you can use the, your position in the society, your position in the Sangha, your, <clears throat> your gifts, your talents in whatever unique ways they manifest without it becoming egotistical. <clears throat> 